When it comes to the most historic ships of all time, Christopher Columbus's largest vessel is one of the most famous yet. Not only was it used for his first voyage across the Atlantic, but it was converted in part for the first Spanish settlement in America. But the story of this ship is so much more than its technological marvels or historical landings. Her life was filled with mystery, mutiny, and scandal. So before we delve into why Santa Maria is such a big deal, or shine a light on her darker secrets, it's worth setting the scene to understand why the ship has never been discovered. It's the 15th century, and Chinese and Indian luxuries for European markets are transported over a long and hazardous route through Arabia. In the interest of securing a shortcut for trade, Christopher Columbus, working with the Spanish crown, summoned an exploratory fleet of three small ships to sail across the Atlantic. The largest, clumsiest, and slowest was a three-mast vessel named the Santa Maria. Her exact dimensions have been debated for years, though it is commonly accepted the boat was at least 70 feet in length, carried a crew of 40 men, and was not exactly the most beautiful sight to behold. In total, four replicas would be made since none were exact. The exact original configuration remains a mystery. What we do know is that the other fleet members, Nina, and Pinta were comparatively much older. At about 50 feet across, they tended to be used for coastal trading rather than ocean crossings, which immediately added risk to Columbus's aspirations. The Atlantic Ocean is fierce. It covers one-fifth of Earth's surface in an S-shape, separating the continents of Europe and Africa and both North and South Americas. Though not as large as the Pacific, the fact its name derives from ancient Greek mythology to mean Sea of Atlas hints at its reputation for size and difficulty. However, the smaller ship's speed and maneuverability would provide an edge when it came to navigating the shallow waters of islands, assuming they could survive the rough seas of the ocean. Thankfully, Columbus rigged them with state-of-the-art technology to compensate for their shortcomings. Triangular sails meant that they could hang at a 45-degree angle to the deck or even 20 degrees, and still receive enough lift on the outer edge to propel the ship forward. Cutting-edge improvements like this had proved perfect for the strong coastal winds in Portuguese journeys to sub-Saharan Africa. Not only that, these 15th century caravels had their rudders moved to the rear center of the ship, a stark contrast to designs of the previous decade that had the rudder firmly on the side. This increase in the movement would come in handy when these smaller, lighter ships had to navigate coastal rocks. The Santa Maria, by comparison, was a much heavier cargo ship. At approximately 110 tons, it didn't have the humble grace of its siblings, but the size of this formidable ship not only granted more space to its crew, sailors in the Nina and Pinta would be overcrowded. It also made it tougher for when the Atlantic waters became choppy. With this balancing act of ships, it did mean that there was every chance that Columbus would return from his voyage, if at all, with a smaller fleet. That of course would become true, but for now, he had his crew of 86 sailors across three boats search for the elusive passage to China from India. Little did they know that the real dangers weren't from the likes of Poseidon, but from each other. It should be noted that finding boats for his journey was not easy as Columbus couldn't afford to travel port to port. In addition, the small sizes of Nina and Pinta meant it was hard to find people to commit to the voyage. In the end, he would have to comprise his crew of inexperienced sailors and criminals just to make the numbers, but that was only the first challenge. Working on any ship was not fun. The crew would be constantly engaging with rigging, trimming sails, and checking for leaks. So much so that even if you were off duty, you'd have trouble sleeping with the rest of the crew stomping around you. As for hammocks, guess again. These were not in use yet, so for the 20 crew of the Nina and 26 workmen of the Pinta, it was as tough as the food they had to eat. Even though Columbus had no idea how long he'd be at sea, a year's worth of dry goods were stocked for the journey. Salted anchovies, pickled beef, dried grains, and chickpeas. And of course, there were hard tack biscuits that would break your teeth unless dipped in the communal slurry. Worse still would be when salt water leaked into barrels and the crew would wait until darkness to eat porridge so that they couldn't see the maggots. It's understandable how conditions like this could create discontent amongst the men. 
especially those who had spent more time in jail than on a boat. But tensions and arguments weren't exclusive to deckhands. Columbus, who was the admiral, had a problematic relationship with his captain that almost threatened the entire mission. Essentially, the ins and outs of the maritime protocol were overstepped, it is alleged, by Columbus, although his case would be that technically he had the right of control, that it was the captain who was out of line. Some precise borders with regards to who should be in charge were never fully resolved throughout the entire journey. It was a constant tug of war over the flotilla that resulted in dismayed ordered and mixed messages. Even with the paper trail of Columbus's journals and court documents upon their return, there is simply not enough knowledge of the circumstances to determine an accurate verdict. Columbus would purge his captain's name from his own writings as much as he could, though it should be noted that there was an accusation of treason, a crime which carries the death penalty right when the voyage made a breakthrough. Santa Maria arrives in America, the New World, leading to one of the most transcendental encounters of history. Over the next two months, Columbus and his men would sail from island to island, though their exact itinerary remains disputed. But this incredible discovery was tainted by Columbus's paranoia. When Columbus was getting paranoid and imagined that the Pinta, which was last seen on 21st November, off the coast of Cuba, had gone in search of gold or was returning to Spain to spread lies about him. Things got worse for Columbus when, on Christmas Day, Santa Maria ran aground and got wrecked in Haiti. It was here that finger pointing and claims of treason were leveled for the captain refused Columbus's plan to extract the ship from the sandbank, instead seeking help from Nina. Columbus wrote that the shipmaster was mutinous throughout and alone responsible for the still missing Pinta. Though he would seek military justice on return to his homeland, it appears that the state did not agree there had been any violations. Yet the squabbling on the beach that day would only get worse. According to his writings, Columbus ordered his men to strip the wood from Santa Maria to build a fort and a tower. He felt confident that he could overpower the natives if he needed to and become obsessed with their stories of gold. And so, Puerto de la Navidad, Christmas port, was built, with 36 men composed of carpenters, tailors, and doctors assigned to run the new settlement in his absence. The hull of the Santa Maria remained where it was and Columbus returned to Spain on the Nina. He did explore the islands before heading for the Atlantic, however, and found the Pinta, though what had happened to his little ship upon return has been lost to history. Then a year later, Columbus returned to his settlement only to find it burnt down and eight men dead. It turned out that soon after he left, the men quarreled over gold and women, eventually turning on themselves. It seems the seeds of paranoia had grown into brother killing brother. Columbus built a settlement further up the island, though the exact position of the original one remains unknown. Even when amateur archaeologists had a lead in 1977, nothing inclusive was discovered. As for the Santa Maria, upon Columbus returning to Spain, the wreck was never seen again. Historians have tried to discover the body of the first ship to arrive in America, but to this day, nothing has been found. How much of that is because Columbus wanted to hide his treasure from the men he distrusted, a crew made of liars and cheats and criminals? And how much of that is due to the ignorance of an inexperienced crew in an unfamiliar land? Despite the widely known accomplishments of Santa Maria, there still remains holes in her story. We will never know exactly what the relationship was like between Columbus and the captain, and we can't know where the fort made from her wood once stood but we can know that the secret she took to the bottom of the ocean will never be discovered. And it appears that's what Columbus intended. But what do you think? Was Columbus trying to hide his treasure or was it bad fortune that keeps the Santa Maria hidden? Let us know in the comments. Be sure to share this video with a plucky treasure hunter you know. And if you'd like more stories on famous ships and their crew, then leave a comment. As always, don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you soon.